the economy, d demand in the economy comes from two sources, money you've already got or money you borrow. So the former is turnover of existing money, GDP, the latter is credit. And every capitalist economy runs largely on credit. And what we've reached is we've, we've borrowed too much and the economy is now deleveraging and that's why it's in a slump. But the banks, the bank is the, the one element of society that always profits by creating more debt. So they're always gonna want to create more debt and they'll saturate one market and saturate another. And we're now getting to the point where they've saturated the final market they can hit, which are, you know, university students. The only ones they can go after that are high school students and babies. And I don't think they're gonna to manage to get uh, kids with diapers to start taking out credit cards. And what it means is they, they, they're really unable even to get onto the first ladder of, of, of being involved, of, of getting any benefit out of the society they're contributing to. If you walk in with a 45,000, 50,000 pound debt, you can only, you have to get a job. You have to work at something whether you like it or not. Uh, all the creative elements are, are constrained and in fact it encourages people to be conservative about what they do with their minds and their talents rather than taking any risks. And that's the opposite of what capitalism is supposed to be about. The, the whole thing's been turned up is basically rent seekers are taking over the economy because that's an enormous profit, 45% of the funds in, you know, of the turnover becoming net revenue for the, for the providers. That's a gigantic profit and they're getting it for, two, for fundamentally because you, you can't afford not to get educated. I mean, you can't afford not to, not to die you know, and you can't afford not to get educated. And those are two reasons why the market system simply fails when you talk about both health and education. Because if you get to, you're told by effectively you've got a disease, you're gonna die unless you get the world's best surgeon, then you're gonna pay totally over the top price because the choices are pay a lot of money or die. That's what you think, okay? And the same thing with education. You think if you don't get the best education, you're not gonna get anywhere at all. So pay a fortune or remain on the, on the scrap heap. And that locks you in to make choices in a way that's absolutely nothing like when you go down to the supermarket, where you get a choice between different brands of muesli, you know? Uh, and, and you can sample the different mueslis and work out which one you prefer and what's the best trade off between the cost and the, and the quality you want and so on. And you'll make that decision and you make it hundreds of times in your own life. So the market system requires that knowledge for you to accumulate. And you simply can't accumulate that knowledge about hospitals, about doctors, about schools. Universities, I mean, I have university students who are, you know, applying to go to Oxford and Cambridge because they think that's where they get the best education in economics because those are the leading universities in the world. Now, if I want to point out to those students they're going to get a very mainstream, narrow, non-critical education, they don't even know what I'm talking about because as so far as they're concerned, there's economics and there's, you know, no, there's no economics. There's not, there's different approaches to economics. So they go in and they make a decision once in their lives which is ignorant of the vast range of choices that actually exist and which locks them in permanently. Now, that, that's a situation where the market information that you need to have before you can make a decision simply doesn't exist for those students. So we're applying an analogy which works when you go to a supermarket, which even works when you go buying a car, you know, doesn't work when you're talking about fundamental life choices like educational health. We think about debt in the sense of like if you said, I'm going to borrow my watch, you know, you take my watch and you don't return it. You know, I have to work to save the money to pay for this thing. Uh, I can't use it while you've got it, et cetera, et cetera. So when you think about interpersonal debts, it really is, uh, you know, theft effectively not to pay back the person you borrowed from. So we have that vision we then apply it to banks. But the technical way that banks make money, create money in the first place and create debt, is by recording an asset on one side, which is the loan that they're giving you, and then putting that amount of money in your bank account or in the bank account of somebody you're buying an asset off. And it's literally the, che the cheapest, simplest thing to produce you can possibly imagine. And of course, they can make a mistake in whether they should give it to you or not. So we treat it like a thing they had to work up and save the money for and they're lending out what they've already created and it's got to be carefully monitored and so on. No, they, they, it is the simplest thing in the world to make money if you're a bank, to create it. And they can make, because it's so simple, they're encouraged to create as much as they can as possible and to ignore the risks because even if they do make a bad loan, uh, if they have increased the volume of turnover at the company, the bank, while they're doing it in their term, they can leave with a nice large gold, you know, golden, golden handshake, golden parachute, whatever else, and somebody else has to wear the consequences further down the line. Like, I actually uh, date the beginning of the debt crisis that the English economy is now in to Maggie Thatcher. 
not because I'm being anti Maggie Thatcher, but because, because I can show that shortly after she took office, the creation of debt went through the roof. Okay? And now what's happening? We're getting, we're blaming the Tony Blairs and even the, Cam and the, and the, the, the Camerons and so on for the state of the economy now, when the debt engine that set the whole thing off was started by Maggie Thatcher 30 years ago. So people w don't wear the consequences of their bad decisions about creating debt. It's the future generation that does, and we're now that future generation. They, they talk about how you can only model a complex system like the economy of making what they call simplifying assumptions. But what they call simplifying assumptions, any sane person would call fantasies. Okay? So their fantasies include that banks, debt and money don't matter. One of their fantasies. And how do they get that fantasy? They say that, oh well, banks just uh, intermediate. Banks arrange a loan from a saver to a, to a borrower and they charge a fee for arranging it. And they don't play any active role in creating money. Now the Bank of England, bless their cotton socks, have come out with a fabulous paper saying that's nonsense. Okay? Banks are originators, they are not intermediators. And when they originate, they simply write an asset on one side, which is the loan that you owe to them, and a deposit on the other side, which is a liability for them at the same time. And they create money in that sense. So that is an essential part of the dynamics of capitalism. Now, when you look at it, it shows that the creation of debt by banks is a huge part of both the creation of money and creation of demand and income. And equally, when debt's paid off, it's a destruction of money and a destruction of demand and income. So it's a vital issue, and they ignore it by the simplifying assumption that banks are intermediaries, intermediaries rather than originators. And that's it, in some ways, it's the simplest, stupid, wrong assumption they make to make their lives easier as mathematical modelers. Uh, but it's, it's, the, it's the core one because once you've done that, you ignore so much of the real world, you might as well be writing um, you know, fantasy novels for, for Disney. The interesting thing is before the crisis, every university economics department pretty much had a, a <coughs> pardon me, had a, a non-mainstream person like me and some guys. There'd be a Marxist or an Austrian, an evolutionary economist, um, a post-Keynesian. They're all there. And because they were outside the, the group think that dominated the rest of the department, the department would tolerate them, but give them, you know, teach, get them to teach courses in micro, maybe give them an honor, a master's course they can teach in Marx or Hayek if they really want to, but just tolerate them, ignore them. But then those were the people, overwhelmingly, who came out and said there's going to be a crisis. And obviously the most prominent people being myself and Wynne Godley, um, but plenty of other uh, non-orthodox economists came out warning about this. And then, of course, when we get the, the crisis hits and the mainstream has no idea and they're completely flummoxed, uh, in total panic mode, and the people they used to ignore down the corridor saying, ha, 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 we got it right, you know, they used to say, right, we're going to get you. And then suddenly the, the, the sort of tolerance that used to exist inside economics departments of a few dissidents because you couldn't get rid of them suddenly becomes let's target those people. So in fact, the hostility to non-orthodox views inside the profession is worse now than it was before the financial crisis. Long-term effects is what I, what I call credit stagnation because the mainstream is what they call secular stagnation. If you look at how they define it, this is Larry Summers and his mob of friends uh, around MIT, they define secular stagnation as saying the economy slowed down because parents are having less babies and engineers are having less good ideas. That's their explanation. Now, the real reason the economy slowed down is because banks have created so much debt that people are unwilling to take on any more debt and banks themselves are reluctant to lend because there's now a real worry they, that they'll have bad debts out of any, any new debt they create. So you have this very high level of private debt which doesn't tend to go down all that much and doesn't tend to rise either and therefore the change in debt is credit and therefore credit is very tiny now after the crisis where it was very big before the crisis. So if you look at the American economy um, going roughly from memory, I think the the annual change in debt, which by changing debt you create credit, the annual credit therefore was about 12% of GDP in the last five years before the crisis. Since the crisis, it's been 2% of GDP. Now what that means is a huge part of the, the source of demand the economy was used to all the way through the 1990s and 2000s is suddenly not there. And it can stay not there so long as the debt levels remain high, as we've seen in Japan, for a quarter of a century. So it's permanent stagnation unless we reduce the level of debt. When the conventional economists say lending is between a saver and a borrower, we all know so people who are savers, we all know people who are borrowers, and we, 
immediately use that analogy and that, that's how we interpret what they talk about banks. The same thing happens when you talk about a surplus. We think, oh, if we want to save money, you know, we basically, we, we have income coming in, expenditure going out, we want a gap between the two and that gap is savings and the bigger that gap is, the, the better we are for the future so the government should do the same thing. That's the sort of analogy we have. In fact, when you look in the aggregate, it's impossible for us in the aggregate to save more money unless the banks create more debt or the government runs a deficit. Because if you want to save money, what it means is you're going to spend less, okay? And therefore, you're going to buy less cups of coffee. So the coffee shop you buy coffee from is going to have less turnover for, for, for coffee. So your, your increase in your bank balance will be matched by a, a, a fall in theirs, and in particular, a fall in the turnover they get. So the incomes in the entire society come back to being lower than they were beforehand. And it's simply because when we talk about saving, we're talking about saving money, okay? Now, there's a set stock of money. If it doesn't change, let's take that as a mental starting point. Let's say there's a, let's say there's a trillion pounds in the, of money in the US, UK economy. Then in the aggregate, the economy can't save and get to 1.1 trillion, okay? It's got to create it somehow. Now, the two ways you can create it is that banks can offer more loans than they, than they get back in repayments, so they create more debt, and by creating more debt, they create more money, or the government can run a deficit, okay? If the government spends more than it takes back in taxation, it injects money into the economy as well. So the proper analogy to think about the government is that it's not like a household, which is where this whole saving myth comes from. It's like a bank. But a bank, a bank's money creation is by having a difference between new loans and repayment of old loans. And the government's creation of money is by having a difference between taxation and spending, where by spending more than it taxes, it actually creates money and ejects it into the economy. Now, the other real dilemma I see in people thinking about this is that they've always got examples, and I've got plenty, of government wasting money by dreadful, you know, dreadful ideas, bad policies, um, all this sort of stuff. That's partly by the by because we've also seen, you know, banks create monstrosities in the housing sector, okay? So they both make mistakes. And really the thing is, well, let's try to get them both to, to do better. So we have banks, let's have banks funding investment and entrepreneurs rather than property speculators, and let's have government funding educators rather than bureaucrats, you know, that sort of thing. But they both have to create money for the amount of money in the economy to grow so that you and I can actually save more in the aggregate. I don't think we should have them at all. And like, this is the other thing, and this is where the problems come from. Most of that money has gone to the top bureaucracy. Uh, and there's been actually some good academic studies done now, particularly in America, analysing the increase in funding going to education and, and researchers versus the funding going to administrators at universities. And fundamentally, the incredible increase in fees in America has more than 100% of it has gone to the administrative layer rather than the educators and the researchers. And England compounds that by this ludicrous belief that the English bureaucracy seems to have, or the government seems to have, that the more you measure things, the better they'll, they'll turn out. So we spend all our time measuring, you know, uh, academic output here, and, and, and all the measuring sticks then distort what people actually do. And you spend so much of your time measuring and monitoring and judging and evaluating that there's bugger all time left to do actual research and, and teaching. So it's, it's this whole mentality of, of privatising on the one side, regulating to control the privatisation on the other, and out of, it, out of it all we get a poor education system and poor, poor health and poor housing. And like I, I, was, I was a student at Sydney University back in 1971 to 75. And back in those days, there was a the limitation to get into the university was your high school certificate score. And the fees, there were scholarships for some and fees for, for the majority, uh, but the fees were relatively minor compared to what they are now. And you students, when they turned up, didn't think they'd bought their degree, okay? The majority were there on their competitive entry into the university and they didn't have, they, when they paid the fees, they were up front and they were over in, in one year. And having done that, they weren't thinking, I've got this debt to repay. So they'd turn up to university and spend three days on campus. You know, and I'm talking about my own personal experience. You'd be involved in discussions, you'd form your own seminar groups because you were there to be stimulated and educated and so on. And you didn't expect to pass because you hadn't bought your degree. And now that we've got this attitude that students are paying for their own education, it's 
you know, you pay for a pack of muesli at the supermarket if it makes you sick or it doesn't give you the nutrition you want, you expect to be able to go back and complain. You think you've bought a product. Well, the same thing is being applied to education, but that's, it's not the same analogy. So if we actually want to then uh, be critical of students, there's now a pressure to say, well, you know, I've paid for it, why shouldn't I get it? And grade inflation comes out of that, and the English system seems rife with grade inflation. Um, and you have students who are too, busy, too focused on earning the money to repay their debt to actually be at university engaging in the university experience in the first place. So the quality of, of, uh, of students' focus on what they're learning has, has gone down dramatically over the years. And it's rather than improving, which the whole idea about marketising education was to make it better, it's reduced its quality quite significantly. You know, I often tell my students when I show them data from, on this whole thing that if I wouldn't make this data up, if I was trying to invent a case to support my arguments, I wouldn't invent what I get in the real. I'd be, think it'd be too outrageous, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so there's, yeah, you see where you're at. That's the red line is private, private debt as a percentage of GDP in England from 1880 until now. And that's when Thatcher got to office. Yeah. And that's when the crisis hit and that's now. But the neoclassicals still argue with me because they are so wedded to saying this stuff can't matter. And I'll show them that. And you can see literally cognitive dissonance in their minds, you know. Uh, and it really is exactly the same situation as, as, as Galileo trying to explain planets and the sun and orbits to Ptolemaic astronomers. They, they simply can't comprehend that the Earth is not the centre of the universe. That particular myth um, has become a huge part of their um, way of thinking. I remember a lot of my friends ended up the invisible, visible hand is in your pocket. You know, uh, but they have this idea of the invisible hand as being a coordination system. And what they're really talking about, uh, if you want to be sophisticated about it, is that there's a complex system out there that has outcomes that are different to what people individually intend. And that's true. But they've produced a totally bastardised and stylized version of it, which argues the market reaches a point of perfect um, balance of people's interests so that you get an optimal outcome for society. And that's what they'd see the perfect hand as achieve, the invisible hand as achieving. When you look at the market as a complex system, like any complex system, it has booms and slump cycles, uh, beneficiaries and losers, and they will change over time. And I'm trying to say, look, drop this naive and wrong way of interpreting what Adam Smith had to say in the first place, and then develop a modern understanding of the economy as a complex system. And yes, it does have outcomes that aren't what people expect, but they're not optimal. They imagine that we live in as like a, in, in effect, they have this world of barter, which this mythical world as well that never actually existed, where we all walk around with, uh, some of us are carrying pigs and others are carrying apples, and we work out exchange rates between the two of us and, and we use cowrie shells as, as a as a intermediary to save having to calculate the pigs in terms of the apples. And it's really, as, as Minsky once said, it's like a model of a New Guinea highland tribal society with only one dif difference. That's not how the New Guinea highlanders behave anyway. It's a completely mythical vision that barter is what we do. Now that is, you can actually blame Smith for that because Smith, is, he, did, he did use the phrase invisible hand twice. And in, in, in the second time he used it, which is in The Wealth of Nations, he was talking about it being a reason not that you should have a market-oriented system, but he was using it as an explanation for why English manufacturers would not move production offshore from England to the Netherlands if we reduce tariffs. It's actually an argument totally different to the way that it's used. But it's such a powerful analogy, it gripped their minds. The other analogy, which he did use in, in exactly the way that economists think about it now, is to say that humans are the only animals that truck and barter. He literally did say nobody ever saw a dog make a fair and deliberate exchange of a bone with another dog. Okay. But in fact, barter is not what we humans do in, in society. And the work that you know, my, my friends Michael Hudson uh, Cornelia Wunsch and in David Graeber in particular for popularising this research have shown is that our societies began as gift societies. Okay? And we, we bond with each other by actually giving gifts to each other. And in our minds in those early cro societies, we kept tally of, uh, of who'd been generous to whom. And you, you had a so social cohesion. If everybody was generous to everybody else, that was the nature of those early societies. They'd start to break down when you got more than about 150 people which is why you had the tribal developments and splitting out of different groups. Then we've got agriculture, and this is particularly going back to the Sumerian period. Um, the, you had the formation of large societies, 
and then the record keeping of this set of mutual obligations became delegated to a sort of combination of religious and state authority. And that's what both the state and the banking system evolved out of over time. But they were all based on credit. And you can find all these early contracts written in cuneiform tablets, which are talking about people making exchanges on the basis of debts. Now, the debts might have been measured in various commodities at different times, but they were credit obligations. And you'd hand over a credit obligation as a cuneiform tablet, record it and keep it at the, at the church stroke state, and that would then enable the commerce to occur. So we've always been credit and uh, effectively gift-based societies. Barter is absolutely trivial component of human history, only in the, the strangest of circumstances, and normally, as David points out very well in his book, very ritualized. It's not a standard thing whatsoever. So the standard stuff is we, we have a, a what became, it was originally a gift-based exchange system that has become a credit-based exchange system. And barter is largely irrelevant. But they model as if barter is the whole way that we've always behaved. And so they've got a very elaborate model of a barter economy which has never existed on the planet. Now, what, what they do is they really try to model the whole economy by taking a definition of an individual consumer and a definition of an individual producer and then extrapolating those conditions that they derive for the individuals to the social collective level and then seeing that we can explain the market interactions as extrapolations of what individuals do. But that, that therefore means you look working with a single individual. A single individual does not have a distribution of income. Okay, a single individual has an income and that's it. Okay? Um, and they imagine that all the phenomena they see are like a projection of what this individual does. So using that individual, assuming the individual has an income and then varying the prices, notional prices between different commodities, they can drive a demand curve for that individual that says that, okay, the price of a particular commodity uh, falls, the consumer will buy more. And that's what they call the law of demand. Now they then use exactly the same thing at the aggregate level. Okay. And of course, because they're working from an individual to the aggregate, they're ignoring the distribution of income. Okay. Now, it turns out that they're wrong even on their own bloody grounds, which I find really frustrating trying to get through to them, uh, because some mathematical economists, back, starting back actually the year that I was born, 1953, you can find research on this, but mainly papers in the 60s and 70s, they said, well, when we do that exercise of driving an individual's demand curve, we assume that changing those relative prices doesn't change the individual's income. But if we're trying to derive this at the level of a society, of course, we, our theory says that prices are a major determinant of income. So we can't do that anymore. So once we drop that assumption and say, let's have two individuals, and we therefore vary the prices of the commodities they're consuming, do we get the same result? The, the demand curve at the aggregate necessarily shows that demand will rise as price falls. And the answer is no. Okay? They've technically proven the answer is no. And if they're using their theory, they can get any curve you can draw, like, you know, like, like a polynomial, anything, any curve you can draw by putting a thing on, the, on a piece of paper and wobbling it about by not crossing over and by not going up so that there are two values on the, on the vertical axis for one value on the x-axis. Anything like that, according to their theory, is a legitimate demand curve. Now, they, they don't use that at all. They then say, well, let's make some simplifying assumptions, which mean we can ignore this, and the simplifying assumptions end up being not just that all consumers are the same, so we all have the same tastes, but also that goods are all the same. So if you increase your income by a factor of a thousand, you will still consume any two given uh, commodities in the same proportion. So if I consider you as a, you know, Bill Gates um, back at university before he concocted Microsoft and he spent 10% of his income on pizza and 90% on, you know, textbooks, then now that he's earning what he's earning on an annual basis now, he's spending 10% of that on pizza and 90% on textbooks. Nonsense, okay? And I'll give you my favorite quote from this literature. It shows how delusional these guys are because they're so wedded to the belief that this theory is self-consistent that they'll get a result which contradicts it and that they'll either completely assume it away or they'll make some absurd assumption and say that it's reasonable. So this is a quote from the very first paper, 1953, by a guy called Gorman. He says, the necessary conditions quoted above seem intuitively reasonable. It says, in effect, that an extra dollar of income will be spent in exactly the same way, no matter to whom it is given. That's not intuitive reasonable, that's delusional, okay? 
I'll give you another one. Paul Samuelson. Everybody knows Paul Samuelson's name. Samuelson, facing the same issue, shortly after this guy published his paper, argued that it was, you know, it was very, very wrong to argue that you could treat an entire society as an individual, okay? which was what they were doing to derive what they call community in, um, indifference curves, which were part of the theory of international trade. But he then said, well, it's reasonable to think that in, inside a family, redistributions in the family are done so to, to maintain the ethical worth of every dollar. That's a quote from the paper, ethical work of every dollar to be the same. So somebody, we earn income in this family, we all pool it to reflect what we all agree are the contributions that each of us are making to the family. He then says, it is simply a matter of assuming the same mechanism at the national level. So America is one big happy family, shooting itself, <laughs> <laughs> committing suicide, robbing itself, etc. It's one big happy family, according to Paul Samuelson. And he then said it's a rigorous proof that what happens at the micro level scales the matter. It's not a rigorous proof, it's total, pardon me, I'm going to quote an old phrase from a newspaper that once got published in the Sydney Morning Herald by a journalist, is a good friend, but she took me out of context and published it. I said she could use the quote. I said that is total, total bull bullshit. That's what they deserve. It. They have theories which have got assumptions that are total, total bullshit, and they then push them forward because they're wedded to the belief that it's a coherent system when they've proven that it's not. There's a validity to it because, like I've just been in Cuba just recently, and uh, there's a brilliant Hungarian economist called Janos Kornai that people don't read anywhere near enough. And Janos gave an explanation for why the socialist system slowed down and didn't innovate the way the capitalist system did. And what he talked about was socialism being supply constrained. So every project was worthwhile in the socialist system. You wanted wages to be high. Um, and, and what it meant was that it was because every investment project was, was worthwhile, no investment project got all the money funds it needed to, to do properly. And therefore, you, the only way you could actually um, maintain output targets, which kept on rising every year, was not to innovate. You, if you wanted to use more motorcycles next year than last year, then the easiest way to do it is use last year's model. And I've literally seen that case with, way, way back in the 70s when I was a student, my then girlfriend's brother couldn't afford to buy a Yamaha or a Suzuki 650cc motorbike. So he found he could buy a Russian Cossack motorbike for $650, a dollar per cc, which is about one fifth the price of buying a, a Japanese bike at the same time. When it arrived, we unpacked it from this wooden crate and took off the, um, the, 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 the oil soaked rags that were there to stop it rusting. And it was a BMW from 1942. That was a Russian 1973 Cossack, okay? So there's, there's, there's something correct about that argument, okay? But what we, if we had that in a world without debt constraining everybody in the way that it does, then it would be more effective. And what people are thinking about is, let's get back to the 1950s. And what they're leaving out of that is, well, to get back to the 1950s, we've got to get back to the level of financial resilience we had back then with a very low level of debt. Now, we got there through the Second World War and the Great Depression. We don't want to repeat that process, but that's what's needed for this vision people have about neoliberalism. What neoliberalism has been used to support is a giant, giant growth in the finance sector. It hasn't been about, well, let's see what was actually what made capitalism work more effectively in the 50s and 60s, get back and recreate that situation. It's let's liberate the financial sector. And that's what it's given us, this huge explosion in debt. So I have a certain sympathy for that perspective, but again, it's, 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 they end up having an, an, they have an analogy they don't take full to a full analysis and explanation. And the other dilemma they have is that you are approaching a period where the level of people we need to do serious work, as opposed to what David Graeber calls bullshit jobs, okay, is trivial to the entire population. So we have two choices. We have people working in bullshit jobs, and most of the people who make these defences of neoliberalism work in bullshit jobs. Okay? Uh, or we organise another way of distributing income in general and then try to encourage that innovation. That is what gives humanity its creative engine. And in some ways you can see things like the open uh, software movement as being part of that old, you know, back almost like the Cro-Magnon days. You were respected on the basis of the tools you made. Well, this, the software industry these days, if there's open source, if people could actually you know, get a basic income and then say work on open source software. We get tremendous innovations out of that, okay? So there are other ways to encourage that innovation that people bring back as the reason why we should have a neoliberal world.
I think it's a really sensible idea to destroy 1% of the money supply every year. That's a fabulously sensible idea. Okay? And that's what it amounts to. This is what we, pe people think about austerity as being responsible spending of money, and therefore you tax more than you spend. But if the government's doing that, taxing more than it spends, what it is doing is, is by that particular act, there are other circulation acts that follow on later, but it's taking money out of circulation. So the government is, re by having a surplus of 1% of GDP, is reducing the money supply by 1 or 2% of GDP. And then if it doesn't put that money back into the economy in any other effective way, you've actually reduced the amount of money all of us have to work and we're told to you know, work harder and, and to produce more output. So I'll give a little analogy, which I think Hope will clarify, clarified, and it's not a complete analogy, it's a starting point. But if you had an economy that had a GDP of 100, okay, whatever, 100 pounds, okay, and that economy had one pound note in it that turned over 100 times in a year, and the government decided it wanted to run a surplus of 1% of GDP, what would be the GDP the year after it did that? Zero. Okay? It'd take out of existence the only pound note that existed. Okay? So you have to look at the, the role of the government as a money creator and money destroyer. And by running a surplus, it's a money destroyer. Now, with money being destroyed by the government, where else can you get it? The only other option, option for the public in a national economy is to get it from the banks. So a government running a permanent surplus requires the private sector to be borrowing money to make up for it, which is what happened in the, under the Blair government here, what happened under Clinton in America, and what happened under Howard in Australia, and what happened, I've forgotten his name, but the previous Prime Minister of Canada. All those countries which were running surpluses were actually able to do it because the private sector was borrowing so much money normally in housing booms that it created all the additional money, enabled the government's taxation revenues to exceed their expenditure and run a surplus. But it wasn't a sign of an economy being run well. It was a sign of an economy heading towards a financial crisis.